Welcome to the fourth module of the second week on branching algorithms. As you can probably tell already, this is a topic that we will be covering in two parts, uh, this lecture and uh, the next and the final one. And that's partly because we just have a lot to say about this. Uh, this is a problem called vertex cover above LP. So this is what I was talking about earlier when I said this is going to be old wine in a new bottle. So in fact, uh, this uh, lecture is the first time that we will talk about a new concept called above guarantee parameterization, which is a very natural and a very exciting thing to talk about. So let's get started here. So let's begin by bringing back our favorite problem, which of course is vertex cover. So you might remember that a vertex cover of a graph is a subset of vertices whose removal leaves us with no edges. In other words, it's a subset of vertices that intercepts uh, every single edge in the graph. Computationally, we are typically interested in finding the smallest vertex cover in a graph or typically uh, in the parameterized setting, we are given a budget K and we are trying to find a vertex cover that has at most K vertices. Now, if you will recall from the introductory discussions that we had about what makes a good parameter, then you might remember that a good parameter is of course a parameter that gives you some workable algorithmic insight into the problem uh, and that allows for hopefully FPT type running times. But a good parameter is also one that you expect to be small in most situations. Now, if I ask you, what do you think about the standard parameter for vertex cover which is the solution size that's been what we have worked with all along so far now without context that's a question that's slightly hard to make sense of what do you mean if it's a good parameter uh, it seems like a matter of opinion it's hard to be objective about it of course it's worked out great for us so we shouldn't be complaining um, it's a parameter that's given us linear sized kernels it's a parameter that's given us these really nice branching algorithms that we discussed just earlier this week so what's not to love right we shouldn't be complaining but one question to ask ourselves is, you know, is this a really small parameter um, in most contexts? So as a concrete example, let's think about graphs that have perfect matchings. OK, so if a graph has a perfect matching, what can you say about the size of any smallest vertex cover in the graph? I'm not asking for the exact size because that's going to depend on the graph. Uh, the graph could range from being just a perfect matching to being a complete graph and you know so there's going to be a lot of variety but can you give me a um, guaranteed lower bound on the size of the vertex cover for such graphs? Remember that a perfect matching is simply a collection of disjoint edges such that every vertex in the graph participates in one of these edges. So it's a, it's a matching that covers every vertex in the graph, right? So for graphs that do have these perfect matchings, uh, what can you say about the size of the smallest vertex cover? While you're thinking about this, let me just point out that you can assume for G to have an even number of vertices. And the reason for this is that if you want G to have a perfect matching in the way that we just described it, then G would have to have an even number of vertices. So when G has an odd number of vertices, people do still talk about these so-called near perfect matchings, which are matchings that cover uh, every vertex except for one. But that's the sort of detail that's not really relevant to this question. So don't worry about it and just assume that the number of vertices in G is even. In this case, you can see that uh, whenever G has a perfect matching, uh, its vertex covers are going to have size at least n by 2, where n is the number of vertices in G and n over 2 is the number of edges in any perfect matching. The logic that drives this inequality is probably exactly what you would expect, which is that in general, if a graph has, say, a matching on Q edges, then any vertex cover in G must have at least Q vertices, because notice that these matchings correspond to a collection of disjoint edges, and we know that a vertex cover has to cover 
every edge and since these edges are disjoint each one of them is going to demand their own slice of real estate in the vertex cover so the vertex cover has to have q distinct vertices to even just accommodate for the matching edges and it probably needs some more to accommodate for the remaining edges there are of course classes of graphs that are really nice with respect to this relationship between the vertex cover and the matching size so you might recall that if you were working with a bipartite graph then uh, these uh, quantities are in fact the same but in general the vertex cover could be larger than the size of a maximum matching and uh, whenever the size of a maximum matching is large we know that the vertex cover is also bound to be large now the word large in the context of a parameter doesn't really sound so nice in fact for all of these graphs that have perfect matchings it looks like our vertex cover parameter which we know and love is beginning to look like it has a nasty dependence on n which means that all of these uh, FPT algorithms that we made just this week begin to look like regular exponential algorithms in N. Even the kernel sizes, if uh, you go back to the best kernel you had, which was a kernel of size 2K, it's just meaningless on this class of graphs. It doesn't give you any information at all. Now, of course, to all this, you might say, wait, wait, wait. Look, what are we complaining about? Every parameter is going to have a bad day once in a while. There are going to be instances for which the parameter is going to be large relative to n. We do know this. We expect this. So what's the big deal? We have just uh, uh, you know, made explicit a class of graphs on which this does happen. Is this something to be unhappy about? And to that, I would say you're actually right. Maybe we should not be so upset. But at the same time, there is here a sort of motivation to pause and ponder about, you know, can we come up with a better parameter? Something that is smaller than the standard parameter and hopefully gives us faster running times even on these classes of graphs where the original parameter just happens to be large. Well, one way to think about it is uh, the following. So this lower bound tells us something. The lower bound tells us that, look, the vertex cover size is already going to be at least something. Uh, it's at least, for example, in this case, we talked about the size of a maximum matching. So it's already going to be at least that much. So the non-trivial work really is to figure out how much more do you need on top of this lower bound and that's kind of the question that we are going to tackle here so in fact we are going to work with a different lower bound for vertex cover which is again something that you know you have seen uh, in the context of kernelization so we have the optimal vertex cover which i'm going to denote by vc and you also have the optimal value of the linear program that we wrote for vertex cover, which is VC star. Now, between the two, can you pin down an inequality? Which one of these is always guaranteed to be at least as large as the other? Let me clean this up a bit. All right, so here are the two competing entities, and um, I'd like to know which one is the smaller one. So does this go this way? Does this go this way? Actually, that's upside down. All right, if you remember from last time, uh, the value of the LP opt, of course, is going to be at most the value of the real opt, the, the actual value of the vertex cover. And um, the reason for that is that you're optimizing over a more liberal space, you're allowing for more values uh, than what you would be allowed if you were working in the discrete setting. So we know that any vertex cover is bound to be at least a VC star of G, for sure. The question that we are interested in posing is how much more? And that how much more is what we want to manifest as our parameter. So we're still looking at the same problem as before. We want to know, um, does G have a vertex cover of size at most K? But this time we want to parameterize by the difference between K 
and the LP opt. So this is no longer the standard parameter. This is what we call an above guarantee parameterization. And hopefully that name makes sense because the parameter here is really focused on how much more uh, do you need uh, to form a vertex cover above what you know you're going to need for sure. So it's above a certain guarantee. Now you could pick your favorite guarantee. You could have multiple lower bounds in the size of a minimum vertex cover. We have already seen that the size of a maximum matching is also a lower bound. And so is the size of uh, or the value of the LP opt. It turns out that between these two, and you can try to check this for yourself, between these two, the value of the LP opt is a stronger lower bound in that it's always at least the size of a maximum matching. So if you parameterize above a higher lower bound, your parameter is going to be smaller. So that's the one that we're going to be working with. And uh, we want to see if this problem is FPT. It's not obvious uh, that vertex cover is FPT when you look at it through this very new lens. So that's going to be the subject of this lecture. And this is the this is the main result that we want to prove. We want to say that there is in fact a, an algorithm for vertex cover above LP that runs in four to the K minus LP opt with a polynomial overhead as usual. So it turns out that I think this is a very interesting result on its own right, but what makes this even more crazy is that there are a lot of other problems that look nothing like vertex cover. Forget vertex cover. These are problems that are not even problems about graphs, but they happen to reduce to the problem of vertex cover parameterized by K minus VC opt. So that's very exciting. And those are applications that I promise we will get into in the next uh, video. But for those applications to work, we need this interesting algorithm here. So hopefully you're all motivated to talk about this FPT algorithm. So that's what we're going to do now. Before getting into the algorithm though, let's just recall the LP formulation for vertex cover just to fix up some notation. You've already seen this in the last lecture of the first week. So this is just going to be a quick recap. So remember that we introduced a variable for every vertex in the graph and we have a constraint for every edge. And the variables take values between 0 and 1. And the constraints ensure that if you have a pair of variables that represent the endpoints of some edge in the graph, then the values of the corresponding variables must add up to at least 1. So that's the LP for vertex cover. Now suppose somebody gives us a solution. We can think of this as a vector x with n coordinates. And for convenience, in fact, you can think of this vector as being indexed by the vertex set of the graph. So you could be talking about the value x sub v to denote the value of the variable that's representing the vertex v from the graph g. Also, we will use w of x to denote the sum of all of these values. And we'll refer to this as the cost of the solution x or the weight of the solution x. And we will tend to use these two terms interchangeably. Let me also point out that the all half solution is always going to be feasible for the LP. So if you set every variable to half, all the constraints are satisfied. Of course, this may not be an optimal solution. In fact, it may be quite a bit bigger than the optimal solution, but it certainly serves as a valid upper bound for the value of LP opt. In other words, LP opt never needs to be more than n by 2. Finally, let's also recall that we claimed that there's always a half integral solution to the vertex cover LP. In other words, we have that there's always an optimal solution where the value of every variable is either zero, half, or one. Such a solution is called a half integral solution and it can be found in m root n time where m is the number of edges in the graph and n is the number of vertices. So let's just keep all this at the back of our minds and now we are ready to start thinking about the algorithm. We're still solving vertex cover but with respect to this brave new parameter, which is trying to be much smaller than the previously understood standard parameter. Having said that, a good place to start, generally speaking, is familiar territory. So we have recently seen a branching algorithm for vertex cover. So let's just quickly recall what we did back then. The strategy was essentially to branch on high degree vertices, where by high degree, I just mean vertices whose degree is at least three. 
Now what we did was the following. You pick a vertex of maximum degree. If there are multiple vertices that have the highest degree, just pick any one of them and then you branch on that vertex, which is to say that you explore the following two exhaustive scenarios. In the first, you say you're going to pick this vertex in the solution. So you generate the graph G minus V and there you look for a vertex cover of size K minus one. In this branch, the measure, which back then was just the size of the solution, drops by one. Now, in the other branch, we said that we will not pick this vertex in our solution, but that had the immediate implication that we had to pick all of its neighbors in the solution. So in this case, the measure, again, the size of the vertex cover dropped by at least three, and in particular, it dropped by the degree of the vertex that we were branching on. So we then went on to analyze this algorithm, look at some base cases and so on and so forth, and those details are not going to be as relevant immediately. But what we want to do is really think about whether we can actually leverage the algorithm that we already know. So let's analyze this algorithm with respect to our brand new parameter. And in particular, to keep life simple, let's just focus on the left branch where we're just getting rid of one vertex. So what do we want to do here? What does it mean to analyze this algorithm with respect to this parameter? Well, we want to see how this parameter evolves as we make this change in this graph. So let's actually take a look at this a little bit visually. So here we have K and uh, the value of LP opt. And notice that the gap between them, this highlighted region right here, that is in fact our parameter. So if you want the running time of our branching algorithm to be bounded as a function of this parameter, then we need to show that as the instances evolve in the branching algorithm, this parameter, this gap actually shrinks. So we already know that k is going to reduce by one. So to understand what happens to this gap, how does it shift? We need to understand how the value of LP opt evolves as we modify the graph. So let's take a look at a couple of possible scenarios. First, let's say that k reduces by one as we said that it would, but now let's say LP opt happens to remain the same. For whatever reason, after deleting a vertex, uh, LP opt does not change. In this case, notice that what happened was that K in fact came closer to this fixed value of LP opt. So the gap in fact shrunk, which of course is very good for us. We do want uh, this parameter to reduce and that's happening. So this is a good case for us. Now, just for contrast, let's take a look at a slightly different scenario. So here, as before, k drops by one. That's just how the branching algorithm works. But after deleting this one vertex v, let's say that LP opt dropped rather drastically. OK, so let's say in particular that it dropped by two. Uh, now, I'm not sure if this picture is to scale, but you can double check whatever we are saying with the arithmetic if you're finding the scales misleading in the picture. So in any case, uh, if this happens, uh, is this good for branching? So let's think about this for a second. By the way, uh, you might already be alarmed by the prospect of LP opt decreasing by two. You might be thinking, can this even happen? And we will address that in a moment. But this is just a hypothetical. Suppose it happened, then would this be good for us or would this be bad for us? Well, hopefully you can see that whenever this happens, the gap actually increases. So this is not good at all. You have uh, gone further down in your branching, but your measure has gone up somehow. Of course, you may not have a measure which is exactly the parameter. It may be some sophisticated function of the parameter, but in general, intuitively, if your parameter is increasing as you're making progress in your algorithm, that sounds somehow like not a good thing to happen. So I think we can agree at least at an intuitive level that we want to avoid this kind of scenario. Now, stepping back even further, it should be hopefully becoming evident that to understand how the branching impacts uh, our parameter of interest, which is um, K minus LP opt, we really need to understand how LP opt itself 
evolves as the graph changes. So let's try and get the hang of that and then we'll try and see if we can always remain within some good scenario and hopefully get to the branching algorithm that we are looking for. So let's try to get the hang of this by just asking ourselves some questions. Remember that we are trying to compare the LP opt of the graph G that we started with with the LP opt of the same graph G but with a single vertex removed because that's what's going on in our branching algorithm. So the first question that I want to pose is whether the value of LP opt can increase as we go from G to G minus V. Actually, if the value of the LP opt increased, that would be a very good thing for us because we have that case decreasing. And if LP opt also went up, notice that the gap would shrink even faster, which seems like a very desirable thing. So can this lucky situation actually manifest? Take a moment to think about this and come back when you're ready. All right, the sad answer to this question is no, the LP opt cannot increase after you delete a vertex and uh, the reason is pretty intuitive. So suppose you have an optimal solution for the original graph G, right? Now let's look at the vertex V that was removed. It takes some value here. Uh, without loss of generality, we could be considering a half integral solution, but it doesn't really matter because in any case, we know that XV takes a value that's between 0 and 1. Now let's just block out XV from this vector and notice that what remains is actually a feasible solution for G minus V. You can check this for yourself, it's fairly easy to verify. But now if this is a feasible solution, then we know that the value of Vc star of g minus v is bounded above by the cost of this solution because if nothing else, we can always fall back on this. So the value of Lp opt for g minus v will definitely not be more than this. And now how large can this solution be? Well. We started with Vc star of G, the LP opt of G, and we actually took something away from it. So if anything, this should be smaller than Vc star of G, but the largest that it can be is if X sub V happened to be zero, then we didn't subtract anything at all. So this solution can be as large as Vc star of G, but it certainly won't be any larger. And therefore, the value of LP opt can certainly not increase as you transition from G to G minus V. All right, the next question we want to ask ourselves is the opposite of what we just asked before. Can the value of LP opt decrease after you delete a vertex? Let's just again take a moment to think about this. All right, unlike before, the answer to this question is in fact yes. The value of LP opt can decrease after deleting a vertex. And here's a simple example where this can happen. So consider a graph which is just a star. You can check that the LP opt for such a graph is actually one. Uh, there's at least one edge that needs to be covered. So there's at least one constraint that uh, forces a couple of variables to add up to at least one. As a result, LP opt is one, but imagine deleting the center of the star, then you get an empty graph and there clearly LP opt is zero. So the value of LP opt can indeed decrease after deleting a vertex. However, let's think about whether it can decrease a lot. So for instance, the bad situation that we were describing a few moments ago was when LP opt decreased by rather a lot. Now with the example of the star, we have already seen that the LP opt can decrease by as much as one, but let's ask ourselves if it can decrease any more. So in that example, we said it goes down by two. Let's ask ourselves if that can really happen. So specifically, the question here is, can the value of LP opt decrease by more than one after you delete a vertex? Once again, take a moment to think about this and come back to this when you're ready. All right, so it turns out, spoiler alert, that the answer to this question is no. So the value of LP opt can decrease by one, but not more than one. And again, let's see why. So let's take a look at the LP opt for G minus V. So this is a bunch of values for all the vertices in G, except for V. And now let's append to this solution a value for the vertex V. And let's say that value is one. Again, you can check that this solution is in fact a feasible solution for the LP opt of uh, G. 
Uh, the reason is essentially that you only have to worry about constraints that the vertex V is involved in, but by setting V to one, you automatically take care of those constraints. And notice that the cost of this solution is essentially one plus whatever we had before, which was essentially Vc star of G minus V or the value of the LP opt for G minus V. So now suppose that uh, the LP opt did drop by more than one, then that means that we in fact have a solution whose value is less than VC star of G, but is in fact a valid solution for the LP with respect to G. So if the LP opt drops by more than one, we can use a solution that witnesses this uh, magical drop and uh, we can extend it to a solution that in fact beats the LP opt in the original graph, which just to be absolutely clear is a contradiction in plain sight. So the LP opt cannot drop by more than one. So let's summarize everything that we have learned so far. So the LP opt certainly cannot increase and it can drop, but not by more than one. Okay, so the way LP opt evolves as you go from uh, G to G minus V is that it may reduce by anything between zero and one inclusive. And if you appeal to the half integrality of the solutions, then in fact, you know that there's going to be a decrease of either nothing at all or half or one. So let's just keep this in mind and ask ourselves, what is it that we need to worry about? Knowing what we know now, what is the bad situation for our branching algorithm? So we know that LP opt can decrease by at most one. If it decreases by anything that is less than one, then we still manage to actually shrink the gap. So if it doesn't decrease at all, then there is a nice reduction in the gap. But if it decreases by anything that is less than one, then you still maintain something of a reduction in the gap. So What's the dangerous situation? Hopefully you have also come to this conclusion that the dangerous situation is when LP opt drops by exactly one. When LP opt drops by exactly one, what happens is that both K and LP opt move back the same amount and therefore the gap remains exactly as it was before and our branching algorithm is seemingly not making any progress. So this is the scenario that we have to worry about and somehow deal with. At this point, I would say that we really need some new idea to make progress. I guess it's fair to say that we have more or less exhausted the scope of what we can get out of looking at the algorithm that we already know, analyzing it from the point of view of this new parameter, and perhaps secretly hoping that it would just work. Although I have to say that I think it was a pretty good start. I think almost everything looked like it was working out great, except for this one really annoying corner case, which was when LP opt drops by exactly one. And of course, this is annoying for the first branch where we delete the vertex V, but you can imagine that there's an analogous problem in the other branch where you delete the neighborhood of V and K drops by the degree of V. There, you would be annoyed if LP opt also dropped exactly by the degree of V. So these are really the two edge cases that we have to worry about. I think if we could somehow tackle these, then we are very much back in business. So let's think about what happens when LP opt manages to drop by exactly one, which notice by the way, is the maximum drop that LP opt can experience, right? So it seems like maybe this is some sort of an extremal situation and maybe instances where this actually happens, they are kind of special and perhaps we can tackle them with some sort of a pre-processing rule and uh, just get rid of the case entirely. So let's actually explore this thought, right? So what can we say about graphs where 
when you delete a vertex, uh, the LP opt drops exactly by one. To make things concrete, let's say that we are deleting a specific vertex V and in G minus V, let's say this is some optimal solution for LPVC of G minus V. Now, from our previous discussion, we know that we can extend this to a solution for LPVC of G by bringing back the vertex V and setting the variable XV to one. We already know that this is a feasible solution, but in fact, in this situation, this is also an optimal solution. And the reason for that is that the cost for this part of the solution is LPVC of G minus one, because remember we are in the case when LP op dropped by one. So when we add one back to that, the total cost of the solution goes back to just being LP opt, right? So this tells us something about the graph G specifically, what it tells us is that in the space of optimal solutions for LPVC of G, there is at least one which has at least one variable set to one. Now that was a lot of ones in that sentence, but hopefully the statement is clear. Basically what we are saying is that if there is a vertex whose removal causes the LP op to drop fully by one, then there is some optimal solution for the original graph where some variable is set to one. So this is the situation that's problematic for us. So what if we could create a situation where the original uh, graphs LP had no optimal solution where some variable was set to one. So what's the intuition here? If you go back to the LP based kernel for vertex cover, you'll remember that we somehow had a forcing strategy for variables that took the value one. So it seems like as long as we have optimal solutions with variables being set to one, there is still some remaining opportunity to clean up the graph and force some variables. So this is exactly the idea that we want to formalize now. And now you should be getting some flashbacks to the LP based kernel for vertex cover. So if you remember what we did back then was that we worked with an LP opt solution to classify the vertices into three major groups. Those vertices which took on the value of exactly half and in that lecture we talked about variables whose value was more than half and less than half. However, notice that we can afford to always start with a half integral solution to begin with. So in my picture every variable that is strictly greater than half is in fact set to one and every variable that's less than half takes on the value zero and we can say this without loss of generality. Okay, so with that out of the way, let's recall the reduction rule itself. Remember what we said was that we can delete the vertices of V0 and include the vertices of V1 in our solution, leaving us just with the graph on the vertices of V half. So the reduced instance looks like the graph induced on V half with a reduced parameter K minus the size of V1. So this seems promising in general. Maybe as long as there is one optimal solution with at least one variable set to one, we just try to get to the breakup that you can see in the picture on the left and actually make progress. Now, there are two issues with this that we need to be careful about. First of all, it's possible that there is some solution which has at least one variable set to one, but when you solve the LP, you get the all half solution. So at this point, your reduction rule will actually get stuck and uh, it will show no signs of progress. But in fact, you are still in trouble and you need to do something about it. Now, the second issue is a little more subtle and we will come back to it later, but I just want to flag it now so you are aware. This issue is about what happens to the parameter when you apply this reduction rule. So remember when we are branching, we needed to be careful about ensuring that our parameter actually strictly reduces. That's why we are having all this discussion in the first place. But now, uh, if you think about these reduction rules, they are being applied recursively at every step of the branching program. Now, at some point, if the application of a reduction rule increases your parameter, then you have again undone all the work that you have done so far, and it will become very difficult to control the depth of the branching algorithm. So just keep this in mind, but first things first, let's try and understand how will we ensure that we are making progress as long as there exists some solution in which some variable is being set to one. The answer to that question is going to be this stronger claim. So what we can show is the following. 
for a graph G, we can either always find a optimum half integral solution that is different from the all half solution, or we can correctly conclude that the all half solution is in fact the unique optimum solution. So notice why this is useful. As long as you are in this situation here, you can apply the reduction rule from before. Of course, this is assuming that we can prove that the parameter does not increase when we apply this rule. As I said earlier, we will come back to that. But if you're not in this situation, if you are stuck with respect to this lemma, then, uh, well, you're not really stuck because if you can correctly conclude that all halves is the unique optimal solution, then essentially you never get into this danger zone. So this was the danger zone for the branching algorithm when the LP op dropped exactly by one. But now notice that if all halves is the unique optimum, LP opt cannot drop by one because that's what we just argued a couple of minutes ago. So this is something that's useful to prove. So let's go ahead and try to prove this. The high level idea is going to be the following. We will try to uh, come up with some LP opt. And if that LP opt is already of the sort that we want, which is that it's different from all half, then we are pretty much done already. But if it is the all half solution, then we need to probe it more. So the way we probe it more is by essentially trying to set uh, variables to one, forcing variables to one and seeing if things work out. If after forcing a particular variable to one, we can get an, a solution for the rest, which actually adds up altogether to LP opt, then we are again in business. But if this does not work out for any variable, then we can actually conclude that all halves is the only optimal solution. So let's take a closer look at the strategy. You might want to make a note of the statement that we want to prove because that's uh, something that I'm going to push out of the screen just to make some room. So the first step is to actually solve LPBC of G and get some optimal solution. And uh, if this optimal solution is already different from the all half solution, then we are immediately done. But if it's not, then we are still left with the question of whether there is a solution that is different from the all half solution. So let's think about this a little bit. Uh, suppose we try setting every variable to one in turn. So in particular, what we are going to do separately for each vertex in G, we are going to eliminate the vertex V from G and solve for the rest. And let's come back and consider the solution X, which is an extension of the LP opt for the smaller graph by setting um, XP to one. Okay, so that's what we are going to do. And uh, as we have discussed a few times by now, we already know that this is a feasible solution for the original graph for sure. But the question is, is it optimal, right? Uh, so the cost of this solution is one plus the cost of the optimal solution for the smaller graph. So, you know, if this is optimal, then what can you say? Well, this is optimal means that we are again done because we have an optimal solution that's different from the all half solution. And that's again, because at least if nothing else, XV is being set to one. So again, we are good if this solution for G minus V uh, extended with XV set to one happens to be optimal uh, for any V, right? So then that's a good situation. So let me just uh, summarize that in words. Uh, uh, forcing a variable to one and uh, you know extending the solution for g minus v that turns out to be optimal it's anyway feasible then we are good so suppose this didn't work out for every variable for every variable we forced it to one and what happened was that when you combined it with the lp opt for the smaller graph you got back something that was bigger than vc star of g so we are in this situation apparently stuck. So this is, this is what's happening. Uh, for every vertex V, uh, Vc star of G minus V plus one is greater than Vc star of G, okay? So in this case, we are also done because it turns out that in this situation, all halves is actually the unique optimal solution for LPVC of G. 
and that's probably not completely obvious although it may be intuitive but let's just take a look at the formal argument so recall again that this is the premise for every vertex v we know that the lp opt of g minus v was too big it was certainly bigger than the lp opt of g minus 1. Now notice that because these are LPs which have half integral optimums, if you double these LP opts, you get two integers. And because of that, this inequality can be tightened a little bit further, okay? So VC star of G minus V being strictly greater than VC star of G minus one actually means that it also has to be at least VC star of G minus half, not just VC star of G minus one. You can imagine that this quantity here is half half of an integer so you know you can only fall back so far right you have to be strictly ahead of this so you have to be still at least um, you know this quantity plus half which is vc star of g minus half so now let's prove what we want to prove by contradiction so we want to show that there is uh, you know, no optimal solution different from the all halves solution. All halves is the unique opt, that's what we want to say. So suppose not, so suppose there is something that is different from all halves, then such a solution must have at least one variable whose value is strictly greater than half. And that's just a counting argument. Clearly, uh, if you're different from all halves and knowing that all halves is optimal, it cannot be that it's different just by some variables being set to zero right because then you have a solution that's smaller than the all half solution which is optimal so that's not possible so there must be something that's greater than uh, half to balance out anything that might be less than half but now suppose you pick this variable or the vertex corresponding to this variable for deletion so you have an optimal solution where something was greater than half let's let's you let's actually delete that vertex and restrict uh, this solution to uh, just g minus v so notice that because you have taken away more than half the solution restricted to g minus v just the original uh, presumed solution that's different from the all half solution and is optimal so that restricted to g minus v will be less than uh, the lp opt for g minus half because you started with lp opt and you took away something that was more than half but now this contradicts this inequality here and that's why you are done so what we have shown with this argument is the fact that um, you know, we can always assume that we have landed at a situation where all halves is the unique optimal solution. Once again, we need to make sure that this reduction rule does not increase the parameters. So let's quickly take a look at that argument as well. So remember that this is what we are working with. So we have this partition of the graph into v0, v half, and v1. And um, you have deleted v0 plus v1 vertices. And from our argument from before, remember, we said that um, when you delete one vertex, LP opt can drop by at most one. So let's say we have P and Q vertices here. So when you delete these P plus Q vertices, the LP opt can drop by at most P plus Q. But notice what's happening to uh, K. So K becomes k minus the size of v1 but um, we have lp opt could potentially drop by as much as v1 plus v0 because that's how many vertices we are deleting out here. So that's based on our simple argument from before that when you delete one vertex you know, you never, you never drop by more than one. But now this is not really good enough for us to know because, you know, we have k minus vc star of g and now we have k minus v1 minus vc star of, let's say, g prime, which is essentially the original graph g projected on the vertices that take on the value half, right? So now we really need for LP opt to drop by at most V1 if we were to ensure that the parameter doesn't increase, right? Because if the LP opt drops by anything more, then the gap between K and LP opt in these respective graphs would actually go up. 
So now what's the argument for the fact that LP opt does not drop by too much? So let's make this claim that um, LP opt drops by at most V1 as you transition from G to G prime. Well, suppose LP opt dropped by more than V1, right? So uh, hopefully with all the arguments that we have made so far, you can see where this is going to go. So feel free to pause this video at this point uh, to think about the solution, but I'm going to actually try and eliminate literally V0 and V1 and talk about what happens. So we are left with the graph V half here. And let's say this has a really small LP opt, so it, it drops by even more than V1. So using such an LP opt, which where the value has dropped dramatically, we can try and construct a solution for the original graph G, which is even better than VC star of G, which of course would be a contradiction. So let's use the, uh, the optimal solution. So suppose for the sake of contradiction, that there is uh, x dash, okay, whose value is strictly less than k minus v1, all right? So that's an x, uh, x prime, which is a valid solution for v half. It satisfies all the constraints here. Now let's bring back what we deleted, which is v1 and v0, and let's set these variables to zero and these variables to one. So when you obtain a solution x like that, its weight is going to be strictly less than k minus v1 plus v1, because we have only set size of v1 many variables to one. And is this a feasible solution? Well, yes, because notice that again, the setting of variables in X prime satisfy all the constraints that involve vertices, which are both in V half. And the setting of vertices in V1 to one ensures that you, you meet all the constraints which involve vertices of V1. And notice that vertices of V0 to begin with were never involved in any constraints involving other vertices from V, V0 or V half. So as a result, this is a feasible extension, but it, it is an extension whose cost is even better than the original LP opt, but that means that um, we have actually a contradiction. So the value of LP opt cannot drop by more than the size of V1 as you make this transition from G to G prime. So this is a perfectly valid reduction rule to apply for as long as you can. And uh, the number of times that you apply this reduction rule is at most the number of vertices that are there in the graph, because we need to just keep trying uh, to force each one of these uh, variables corresponding to each vertex to one to make sure that we have eliminated the possibility that there is even a single optimal solution which sets a variable to one. So once we have done all of this, we can be confident that LP opt doesn't drop by as much as one, and therefore our branching is going to in fact shrink the parameter. So we have argued all this for the case when the branching gets into the instance G minus V. In the other case, the branching gets into G minus the closed neighborhood of V, and the argument there is very similar. So I encourage you to think about it and work out why the measure strictly shrinks essentially in the right branch as well. Now, before summarizing everything that we have learned so far, I just want to quickly talk about the most important part of any recursive algorithm, which is the base case, the thing that ensures that our algorithm actually terminates. Now, usually a good place to stop for any branching algorithm is when the measure that you have defined for it hits zero, because that's what will allow you to bound the depth of the branching as a function of the measure. Now, we haven't explicitly defined the measure for the algorithm that we have right now, but you have probably guessed that the measure should simply be the parameter, because this is what we have been focused on all along. This is 
the thing that we argued will shrink when you get into the two branches. This is the thing that we said will not increase whenever we apply the reduction rules. So it's a very, very natural choice for the measure. So we in fact see that as you go down the branching, the measure drops by at least half in both of these branches because we know that of course k reduces by one um, and in this case k reduces by the degree of the vertex that's being deleted these were the two branches that we had if you remember in the left branch we remove a vertex v and in the right branch we remove uh, the closed neighborhood of the vertex v so that's what we have. Uh, so that's what k drops by. And we have ensured that the LP opt, on the other hand, in this branch never drops by one. And in this branch never drops by the degree. But because we are dealing with LPs that are half integral, if it doesn't drop by one, then it drops at most by half. And here also, you can work out that the LP opt drops by at most d of v minus half, which means that overall uh, the measure mu shrinks by at least half and that happens in both branches. So if we are able to show that when the measure hits zero then the algorithm terminates so we can figure out a way for the algorithm to terminate then we are essentially done because in each branch we have that the measure drops by at least half so the number of steps that this algorithm can last on a longest root to leaf path in this branching tree is going to be at most two times the measure that you had to begin with. Right? Just to make this uh, concrete with some silly numbers, let's say that the measure was 10 to begin with and you know that it reduces by at least a half in every step. Maybe in some steps you get lucky, you might have a bigger drop, but you definitely guaranteed that even in the worst case, every time you spawn another layer of the branching uh, tree, every time you go one step deeper into the branching, the measure has dropped by at least half. This means that the branching can last for at most 20 steps in any path from root to leaf right so hopefully that's clear and in fact that's what leads you to the theorem that we set out to prove so this running time comes essentially from saying that you have two branches so you have two raised to the depth of this branching and the depth of this branching is bounded by two times the measure so it's really two to the two times k minus lp opt of g uh, which works out to four to the parameter so that's our theorem and we're pretty much done if we can figure out this stopping criteria so we do want the algorithm to stop when the measure hits zero otherwise this analysis is not complete so what can we say when the measure hits zero what does this mean? This means that the value of k actually matches with the value of the LP opt. So k equals LP opt. Now let's think about after applying the reduction rule that we had in mind, can we really go down another step in the branching algorithm? Does it make sense? So we have k and we see star of g being in the same place and if we were to branch in either of these directions let's say uh, on the left so so i mean it's possible that unlike in the previous case when k equals zero you could actually just look at the graph and say well if the graph is not empty say no and if the graph is empty then say yes because then our measure was just k it was the standard parameter but right now you could be in a situation where the measure is zero but the graph is still non-empty and there is um, there is something going on here so we need a slightly different argument uh, so again let's think about what happens when let's say we try to branch further after having reduced the graph right so let's say we are trying to remove a vertex let's say there is some vertex that's available whose degree is at least three and so on so uh, if we do that then k certainly becomes k minus one but lp opt because of our reduction rule we are assured that lp opt is not going to drop all the way by one so so this can only drop by a little bit less than one but notice that something very funny has happened right now so if you look at this picture you should uh, see a red flag already so this means that in the graph g minus v we are hoping to get a vertex cover of size k minus one but we have a lp opt which is larger than k minus one 
but we do know that any vertex cover must be at least uh, the size of any optimal vertex cover must be at least the the LP opt and this should be G prime sorry about that so G prime being G minus V so since we know that the optimal vertex cover size must be larger than LP opt uh, we know that we have run out of budget at this point we don't have enough budget to actually create an optimal vertex cover so uh, after the reduction rules have done their job if the graph is not already fully resolved then you can actually say no it's going to be the same argument in the other branch so there's really no point in getting into either of these branches because you know for sure that you're headed into no instances so you can pretty much roll up your sleeves and say no uh, if you are stuck with a graph that's not fully resolved even after the application of your reduction rules if this was a yes instance then it would be completely tackled by the reduction rules that you have in place so that essentially is a summary of the whole algorithm. Let's actually recap everything once because there was uh, quite a bit that was going on here. So remember we were working with vertex cover above LP which is essentially the same old vertex cover problem but with a different measure and the measure was how much do we need beyond the LP opt which was a very natural lower bound for the size of the vertex cover and our whole discussion really was focused on this idea that we reuse a branching algorithm that we've already seen before so this was the branching algorithm that just branched on high degree vertices but our main focus was really on ensuring that this measure uh, actually dropped in both branches and so it was a tension between how k is changing and how the lp opt is changing so we made a few observations about the way this gap parameter evolves and to understand how the gap changes all we needed to do was to understand how lp opt changes so we saw that after deleting a vertex lp opt cannot increase and it cannot decrease by more than one so the dangerous situation for us was when it actually dropped by exactly one because in that case the gap remained the same. So we did know from before that we can always work with half integral solutions that can be found in polynomial time and we also had a reduction rule that could get rid of anything that didn't look like half. So we had a way of pruning out vertices which took values 0 or 1 in any optimal half integral solution. But we realized that this was not enough uh, to ensure that we can make progress in the branching. So we proved a stronger version of this claim, which was to say that you can either find something that's different from the all half solution, or you can actually conclude that all halves is in fact the unique optimal solution. And after that, we were back in business. So we could just keep applying a reduction rule for as long as we could. And um, it was not just a one shot application. So this uh, lemma had an algorithmic proof and that's what actually is the reduction rule as well. So you have to try forcing every vertex to one, pretend that it takes the value one and then solve the rest of the instance and see if you can get to a feasible solution for the entire graph where some variable is set to one. It's only when this doesn't work out for every single vertex that you can conclude that in fact all halves is the unique optimal solution. So the time that it takes to apply this reduction rule is essentially n times m root n because you just have to keep finding feasible solutions for g minus v but you have to try this for every single v so that's just uh, overhead of n on top of this running time so it's a polynomial time reduction rule which we argued does not cause the parameter to increase it's again important that you show this explicitly especially when you're dealing with uh, an above guarantee parameter it's not obvious often that these reduction rules are safe in this sense so you do that and once you are assured that the LP opt is not going to drop dangerously you can now get into the branching the branching is the same as before and uh, then we finally had fact that your measure decreases by at least half in each branch so the depth of your branching is going to be at most two times the measure we also argued that you can stop once the measure hits zero and that gave us finally 
the result that we were looking for that vertex cover above LP opt is FPT and it has an algorithm whose running time is 4 to the k minus LP opt. So next time we will see how we can make use of this algorithm to solve some other problems which are interesting on their own right uh, but we will not solve them directly we will simply reduce or transform those problems into instances of vertex cover parameterized above LP opt. That's going to be a lot of fun and you'll hopefully be convinced that all of this hard work was worth it, not just uh, for solving vertex cover above LP opt on its own right, but also for all of these cool applications that we more or less get for free. So I hope you enjoyed uh, being introduced to this important concept of an above guarantee parameterization and seeing how it leads to even faster and even better algorithms for our favorite problem, vertex cover. So this is a good place to wind down so I'd like to thank you for watching and I'll see you in the next video. Bye.